Carving necks is one of my favorite things to do. I love that the wood chips are gathering around my feet as the neck itself is emerging from the square block of wood. Uh, to do this, I want to have a nice firm platform uh, to work from. Uh, this is uh, simply a piece of an 8 inch wide board uh, that gets me up off the table high enough so that my spoke shave fits or my sanding block or whatever. I've got enough room to work and it puts it at a comfortable working height for me as well. On top of that, I have placed uh, this board right here. It actually has a small uh, cove that's been cut out into it. Uh, you can accomplish this by putting uh, a strip of cork down either side of a flat board too, uh, but it allows the fretboard to contact at the two outer edges and it'll stay flat and stable that way. A flat board it would be rocking back and forth on the uh, on the fretboard. If you're doing a classical, obviously that'll be flat. You wouldn't need to do that. Uh, or if you haven't radiused your fretboard yet, this piece here could be flat. On top of that, I've got a 15 degree angle board that I can clamp the peg head to. You'll have to check the angle of your particular peg head, uh, however you're doing that, and make sure that this matches. The platform for the fretboard is just a little bit narrower than the fretboard itself at the, at the narrow part at the top so that it doesn't interfere. I'm going to put the, uh, the whole assembly on here, make sure that it's, uh, it's centered, and then push it carefully up against this uh, clamping block up here. I don't want to be too far up or too far back lest I uh, stress the neck out here. Uh, and then a clamp with a a small felt pad on it so I don't have to have a, a cherry block. Uh, will fit on here nicely uh, and I'm just going to finger tighten that for the moment. Make sure everything is square, this isn't rocking around. And then a spring clamp is all I need down here. Give this one more turn and we're ready to carve. I know I had the neck in the vise before, but I'm going to start working on this from the side. So I've got it down on the bench. I've got this little bench vise here that I can, I can hold this in place and move it quickly. If you don't have something like that, uh, other clamping arrangements or even some screws down into the bench would do just fine. We're going to start with some rough tools to, uh, to begin here and we're going to get more refined as we go. But the whole time I'm going to be paying attention to the wood direction. The heel has already been roughly shaped prior because I needed to do that before I assembled the body. You remember I put my neck on as I'm, a, as I'm putting the back of the body on. So uh, this, at this point I'm going to start with a draw knife. Uh, this can be a rather aggressive tool but if you're not using it carefully, uh, especially on a cedar, I could dig in really fast. But it does do a good job of removing material quickly. Appreciate it and feel what's going on here. What it doesn't do well is go the opposite direction quickly. So I'll normally start with a chisel. I'm going to reverse this uh, neck here for a second so I'm not in the way of the cut. Ah, the magic of movies. Anyway, here's my uh, my chisel, and again I can take material off pretty quickly with it. I'm just going to remove, oh, I can feel it starting to split there, so i got to get careful. Uh, I'm going to take off, just take this corner off here real fast. Uh, and the reason I like using my chisel right now is that I've got reasonable control of it. And if I run down the side of the neck here, I can take it right down to the fretboard pretty quickly. I want to talk about something that's going to be important for the entire carving process, and that's light. I'm going to adjust the light here because right now I've got it set up for the camera, uh, but as I get closer to this fretboard, I need it set up so I can see what's going on. Sometimes you want to see the light, sometimes you want to see the shadow. Before I go there, I'm going to note something that I just did. Sometimes you just run into stuff as you're doing it. I came to the end grain here. As soon as I get up to here, I'm starting to work against the grain. And I immediately, almost subconsciously, made a cut 
at the end like this so I could continue this cut here. Be conscious of your grain direction and what it is you need to do. I like using knives, sharp edges a lot, but that doesn't mean you can't go to a rasp or a sandpaper that will handle these sorts of changes in grain direction far more easily than a knife will. As you're working the neck, your light angle is going to be very important to knowing what's going on. Also your fingers. You can feel stuff that you can't see or confirm what you think you're seeing uh, if the grain gets in the way. Uh, this spruce neck is rather soft uh, and stringy compared to the mahogany necks I usually carve, uh, but I can tell there's a flat spot here right now, or a little, a little divot actually, right in here. Um, a static light is okay, but if you can get your light to be a little more dynamic and come around, you're going to gather a whole lot more information than with just a single location of the light. Now, um, I had already uh, defined uh, a little bit thicker than I wanted um, the taper from the heel to the peg head in a previous, uh, previous video. Um, this is an important one to get very straight. I also know that uh, the side of the fretboard is tapered, uh, but it is straight. So I'm going to avoid touching the outside edge of this, and I'm going to leave this little rough spot right here in the middle until I'm, all, uh, until I'm almost 100% done. Uh, that'll make sure that I don't make any changes in that gradual taper of the neck. Um, trying to keep this flat, a tool you might want to create is uh, flat piece of wood uh, with sandpaper on it. I've cut this one about a half an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch short of the full length until I hit the heel down here. Uh, I shouldn't have to sand dead flat on the back of the neck or dead flat on the fretboard side. Uh, but this will help indicate, and I've been using it here for a bit, uh, where I've got a flat spot. Uh, I can, I can, I've got about a half an inch worth of motion. I can go this way and I can see the high points that the sandpaper is taking off and the low points where it's not. At this point, since I'm shaping, I can even go sideways on the grain. That'll make some scratches here that'll have to be taken out, but it can indicate more clearly visually where a low spot might be. And again, wow, my finger picks that one up real fast. I've got a little more work to do on this one, uh, and then I'll go ahead and refine the, um, the peghead volute and the heel.
Two spots that are always kind of difficult to deal with are the transitions between the peg head and the neck. You can see it's pretty flat here with a straight edge in the light. But before I get to where I want the peg head volute to take off, there's a little bit of a rise there. And I'd like to make that as flat as I possibly can. No matter how much I try to sand, that little bit right there just doesn't want to go down because I wind up sanding over here more than there. So I'm using a little bullnose plane that I've taken the front part off and done a very careful adjustment. So right now it's barely not even taking a shaving here on the neck. But when you get up to the peg head, you can see that very small curl. I have to be careful not to go too far with this because I am doing a climb cut after all by the time I hit the peg head. But this helps to straighten things out for me without continuing to wear away more neck. I can come back and clean that up with knives and sandpaper or whatever I need. Well, there's still a lot of detail sanding to do, but I'm not going to bore you with all of that. See you next time.